Is it good? Go. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. <clears throat> I want to thank you all, first of all, for braving this really cold and wet weather to come out and be with us tonight. Um, we're really thrilled to have Leslie Hewitt and Omar Barada with us tonight. Come on in. <laughs> Hi, welcome. I think there are seats over there. Uh, so we're really thrilled to have Leslie Hewitt and Omar Barada with us tonight, speaking about Hewitt's um, slim yet immensely powerful text titled Postscripts, Archives, Annotations, and the Unfolding of Time as Image and Agency. This work was co-published by Dancing Foxes Press and the Pratt Institute for Photography, and it works out of the fraught and divisive events of 2020 to address questions of agency within archival and photographic practices. Specifically, Hewitt looks at how public might collectively reconcile grief and images of trauma, and she interviews important and provocative thinkers such as Deborah Willis and Ariella Ezele to do so. So thank you so much, Leslie and Omar, for being here tonight. And thank you, Shannon, Barbara, and Karen for all of your hard work in putting this together. Um, we're so excited for what will surely be a timely and engaging conversation. So just want to remind everyone that at the end of the event, at around 8.10 or so, we'll be doing a short Q&A for 15 minutes. So if you have any questions, keep those in mind, um, and we'll be sure to address those at the end of the event. And anybody who is watching on streaming, you can send those questions to Evan, E-V-A-N, at 192books.com. Um, you'll also be able to purchase books at the end of the event in the back. Um, and I highly recommend checking out Dancing Foxes Press, which is a very important art book publisher um, who's doing invaluable work for art book publishing today. Um, you can find their books on dfpress.org. <clears throat> um, so without further ado, I will now pass it on over to Sharon, Shannon Ebner um, to talk more about the PPI series. So thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks again for coming out. Some weather happening out there. <laughs> um, OK, so um, bear with me here. OK, um, so greetings. Um, uh, I'm Shannon Ebner. I'm the chairperson of the photography department at Pride Institute. And I'm joined by Dancing Foxes Press, who are Karen Kelly and Barbara Schroeder. And together we published Pounds Per Image uh, through Pratt Photography Imprint, which is a semi-annual series uh, in its fifth year, actually, amazingly. Um, and Chad Cloffer is the designer of this series. Um, my colleague, Sarah Greenberger Rafferty, uh, also worked on the past two issues with us as they derived from a 2019 symposium at Pratt that we co-organized called Teaching Photographs. Thank you as well to everyone at 192 Books um, for hosting the event and for staying in this conversation with us for a while. It kind of ebbed and flowed with the pandemic. <laughs> um, and uh, so we're really happy that's actually happening tonight. Um, and it's actually PPI's first in-person public event. Um, so it's incredible to share it with you, Leslie. Uh, so a few words about PPI, um, which was inaugurated in 2018. It was envisioned as a serial experiment in art, photography, pedagogy, and publishing. It's a materialist enterprise attempting to address the weight and gravity of images once they are released from their vast networks to re-enter the flow of bodies in real time. The first two issues were with Fia Backstrom and Deep Dalal in 2000, pardon me, 2021, and with Ray Anastas in 2019. If Anastas's first issue took up questions of framing, inviting readers to think about how we look at what we see, how views and the viewpoints of art and culture are assembled by us, how we, quote, make the image in real time, through constructions of identity, race, and property relations, Backstrom and Delal's issue attempted to expand our range of sight, even further outside the frame, writing about their experiences with art and images and what they called 
the sensorium. A positioning of interwoven co-author texts splayed out around the concepts of knowing, handling, and naming, privileging not only sight and seeing, but the full range of bodily senses. And this delivered us to PPI number three, the Hewitt issue. <laughs> Sounds so a fish. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I lost my place, but going off script. Oh my God. Um, okay, finding it, finding it. All right, here we are. We originated as a postscript to the Teaching Photograph Symposium and it became in many regards, the series turned toward real time politics to Tata's urgency as the summer of 2020's racial uprisings and specifically the traumatic imagery that shifted the lens of Leslie's issue. Nope. The traumatic imagery that circulated in the wake of the wrongful deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor shifted the lens of Leslie's issue to position the relations of time and unfolding and unpacking of our image inheritances through archive and annotation that images could become tools not only for possible reconciliation, but also for agency, artistic agency, frames in time. A word I just learned recently perhaps says it best. The word is tempix, which is, quote, a method of reading narratives in terms of time and the current instant. Speaking in the we here, that it was a total privilege to witness the formulation of Leslie's issue, which is a true reflection of the breadth of your practice, Leslie. Uh, the issue is at once deeply personal and yet reaches outwards towards many publics. It asks questions of us, holds us accountable, and gives us new tools for attempting to understand our future. Finally, uh, tonight, Leslie will be in conversation with the writer and curator, Omar Barada, who is also Leslie's colleague and friend. Together, they co-organize co the interdisciplinary series at Cooper Union. The IDS is a public lecture series that is also a seminar course. During the shutdown period of the pandemic, tuning into the ID series was like a warm and glowing light during a sensorially deprived time. I mentioned this as a way to frame this conversation that is about to take place between them. To note that Leslie and Omar have been present and witnessed special occasion to turn the dialogue so that they face each other um, as a dialogue in rotation. So please join me in welcoming them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I uh, hope this is working. Do I need to be really close? Does it matter? It yes. does amplify. It does amplify. Okay, we'll try. Um, thank you. Um, Shannon, Barbara, Karen, thank you to 192. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's uh, what what was just said as just said uh, about Leslie and my collaboration. We've been collaborating for over five years on organizing a, a weekly lecture series and teaching a seminar together. In that capacity, we've hosted. I think almost 150 <laughs> public events together, but we've never had a public conversation no. in this way. We're not, so <laughs> we don't know how this is gonna go. <laughs> We're not actually facing each other. It's a bit awkward, yeah. but it's okay. <laughs> Uh, so we're here to celebrate and talk about this publication, which, as has been alluded to, a deceivingly small book in the sense that the more you spend time with it, the more it expands um, with the questions it raises, the connections it establishes, the ideas it advances. I, I got this equally slim notebook to just take notes while I was reading. <laughs> it, it filled up immediately. <laughs> After the first reading, so then I stopped. Um, <laughs> um, it's a book about m many things, and we'll try to discuss some of them. In particular, it's a book about called teaching photographs, and it's about photographs as um, objects of mourning, as tools of collective witnessing, as sites of political contestation. In a way, it's about uh, photographs as agent in ongoing processes of, of feeling and meaning making, I would say. And so I look forward to discussing some of yes. this with you. Uh, and hopefully maybe also, I mean, crucially, connect some of these questions uh, to your practice as an artist. And mm -hmm. we'll see how, how we do. 
Um, perhaps before we get to the book itself or to the contents of the book itself, um, it's a book that is, as the cover says, with Leslie Hewitt with Ariella Aisha Azulay and Deborah Willis. So I thought perhaps, uh, and this is how it started. It started as um, two public events on Zoom because it was the pandemic. Uh, one, a conversation with Deborah Willis, and which I think was the first one, and then a conversation with uh, Ariella Aisha Azulay. And I just wanted to ask you um, about that that situation and that choice. Sure. You know, deciding to have the, those two conversations with those two people, who whom you have a relationship to, but a very different relationship to each. I think, perhaps, just yes. to contextualize this. So I guess I should also thank Dancing Foxes and Shannon Ebner um, and Sarah as well for the opportunity to work in a long form. Um, and it wasn't intended that it would stretch out, right, to, to such a degree, but it worked. And I think it allowed for going deeper and being more concise um, with, image, with image and word, which I think in my practice in general, there is this constant editorializing um, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of paring down to, to essential elements in a composition. And I feel like in an interesting way, working with a team to pull out um, all of what was necessary to go into mm -hmm. a book as um, an archival object, um, I think was perfect. Mm -hmm. um, it's sad to me. I mean, there's elements of this book that are extremely emotional and very sad. I just think, I mean, I want to smile, but I also am sad um, because it's a little bit of a um, memorial in a way, mm. not only to the death of a woman, um, but also Breonna Taylor and um, someone who I didn't know <laughs> personally at all. But um I almost wish I did after doing this. Um, and also because we all lived through wit a kind of deep witnessing that was so disquieting that it moved people to go outside and gather in, mm -hmm. in the height of the pandemic, you know, like really risk their own health and well being to be together because that's the only way to make sense of a senseless violence world in essence, right? To kind of almost exaggerate a human human gesture like one's humanity. Um, and so through the density of all of that, I'm swimming for meaning myself. Mm. And um, I always look to Deborah I mean, she was, um, her book, Picturing Us, was the first book that spoke to me um, mm. as a student because it dared to talk about images that were extremely scary. Um, and now I'm speaking about lynching photographs or photographs that are part of photography's history, a part of American history. But it's it's so traumatizing to 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 look at that you want to close your eyes and look away and almost um, pretend like that doesn't, you know, that that, that that moment didn't happen of you seeing it. And something about her words and her unwillingness to look away um, in the form of a book, <laughs> before I even met her, I was introduced to her through her book and through her mm. words and through her care um, and preservation of images. I think um, with that, I'm always in conversation with her. Mm. So um, I guess I'm meandering a little bit, but I wanted to at least set the tone of where this um, project kind of began mm -hmm. um, and, and how it transitioned. Um, so I think I always knew that I wanted to acknowledge Deborah Willis from the beginning of the project because teaching photographs, to me, it's like, 
well, you have to include her, you know, um, and we have to figure out how to include her and include her through through me as well, right? Mm-hmm. So um, that was already a given. Um, Ariella Azula, I think, came after. Part of it is because we invited her mm-hmm. in the context of IDS um, and her book, um, The Civil Contract of Photography, also before meeting her, was extremely um, mind-blowing to read, um, kind of decolonizing process that she also, I think, begins to articulate with all of the power dynamics that are um, at play Mm. with the act of photographing and all of the events that play out. I just thought she's just so precise. And um, though she's speaking about a different dynamic, a different historical relationship, um, specifically between um, uh, the Palestine and Israeli positioning, but it's it, it moves across that border to me um, because of some of the same conditions um, as an African-American in the context of the U.S. So I, I thought, wow, that I would love to almost see these two amazing women speak mm-hmm. to each other. Um, but again, also have an opportunity to be inserted, right? Mm-hmm. Because somehow... Um, I'm interested in mediation, right? Mm-hmm. Not really somehow, but like I am interested in mediation. And so that that kind of delay, all right, that 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 is also, I think, a photo, a condition of photography, right? Being just, it's always the past, right? It's always just after, um, you know, even if it's just a second, right? Like what what happens in that space? So by um kind of being there in as a mediator in some way between Deborah Willis and also Ariel Azule, I think, I hope when one's reading, you can kind of make these leaps across time. Um, and, you know, that also, I think, kind of sets the reader in a different position. Mm-hmm. I hope, yeah. Definitely. They do speak to each other in the book through um, the question posed, through the other elements that are more personal to you that are in the book. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the book is very, obviously, very carefully constructed, and there is this um, logic of juxtaposition in the sense that it's not... Different elements are different genres, yes. uh, so it's not a sequence of essays. It's not... Yeah, they're, they're all different genres. They and they and they are set next to each other as opposed to, you know, um, explicitly commenting on each other. Or there is no, you know, conclusion, introduction, or transition that is that is kind of uh, put in between them. So there is a kind of trust in um, maybe a, a subterraneous construction that makes the juxtaposition mm. um, fruitful, which is something that I think is is um, uh, is a good representation of your work in general, in some of the ways you think, some of the ways that you construct images also in your own work. Was this always the way you were imagining the book? How did it come to be this way? Because it's not the same time to do it in the space of a book and to do it in this form that you have worked on and experimented with in the studio in terms of making your photographs or, or your artworks in general. I shouldn't call them photographs. Well, I have to. I mean, I think it's a team effort. I mm-hmm. mean, I think I started because I speak. I do believe that art is speech in mm-hmm. many ways. And so and I know you've heard me say that over and over again to our students. <laughs> um but I do. And I started with, and I'm sure Shannon could attest to this, like just putting images together, like mm. in a line, because mm. I feel like that was how I could try to make sense of what it would mean to um, address the kind of um, the role of being a witness and what happens. What is the internal interior process that one goes through? Right, because you can't unsee. Like once you've you've seen the video, or you've seen the image, or somehow it calls your attention, what do you do with it? 
Mm. And for me, my process was calling up images that had some kind of resolve. I don't know how to describe it. They were moving away from a kind of um, journalistic position, mm -hmm. um, something else. And for that, um, I needed to call on other artists, uh, other ways of speaking that came through photog the, the photographic image first. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think with the team, <laughs> Um, you know, pulling out, you know, um, how to create a context in the form of the book that um, reflected all of the elements that um, I initially pulled together uh, with, with the images. Um, so, and the images also were of artists' works. Um, and the section um, aphorisms, I think, mm -hmm. is kind of that play between pulling on um, previous artists' modes and strategies and ways of address, forms of address with um, this kind of um, poetry, I'd like to say, mm -hmm. uh, or internal mantras or cautionary <laughs> folkloric tales <laughs> of photographing something or after seeing something or like, how can you start to transform that experience? Yeah. yeah, this is the central section in the book. It's called Aphorisms. It's authored by Leslie. And I would, you know, have you been writing aphorisms on and off for years in notebooks? And this is a kind of distillation for this occasion. Did these come specifically in relation to this? Could you say something about? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sure. I'm... They were a surprise for me to read. Okay. In, a way, let's in say. what way? Do tell. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I don't know. There, the, for many. I mean, there's a lot to say about them. I mean, they're reminiscent, and he, I think he's quoted in them. They're reminiscent of the of Robert Bresson's mm -hmm. notes on the cinematograph. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're they're this mix of practical. Uh, you know, notes on practice in a way you could say, and some that seem much more philosophical, or even in some cases, I would say almost mystical in tone, mm. uh, in certain spiritual in tone in certain cases. And they include quotations, so from books like Notes on the Cinematograph, from Picturing Us, from lyrics by Black Thought. <laughs> Um, so from, you know, French cinema to recent hip hop. How great is that? I mean, come exactly. on. No, precisely. <laughs> and, and they also have these moments of these, these moments of, and these moments where I wondered if they were injunctions to self mm. or you know, um, letters to a young photographer, you know, in a way, like the all of these uh, imperatives, uh, which I've listed somewhere in my uh, sprawling notebook, <laughs> you know, listen, 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 mm. listen, listen, five times, escape, 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 three times, abstract, abstract, bright. I mean, there's, there's a few of them that punctuate the, the, mm. the text. So it's a very... I don't know. It, it has a it has a, a very uh, I would say um, how would you say that like a uh, um, moving and enticing tone to it. It has a, a melancholy to it as well, mm -hmm. and it but and it also it it feels it feels very of a piece despite being fragmentary and heterogeneous in terms of the types of, of, of aphorisms or of, of fragments that are in it. Yes. I mean, I, um, I think I've have fought even the title of photographer mm -hmm. since the very beginning mm -hmm. of realizing the impact of, of an image, but even the impact of um, any memory object. And all of us know if we 
have spent a great deal of time with someone and that person goes away or passes away, that thing that they touched or that space that they were in, it has still like some quality. Um, and I was always very sensitive and interested in it. Um, uh, being from a family, and I, I've talked about this before, but uh, of parents who had older, very older parents. Mm. Um, most of my relationship to them kind of came through just story and also thing and feeling kind of a struggle with that because right? mm. it's not the same as the person. It's not the same as being with them. Um, and so I always think about um, really what are the conditions to even um, kind of create or manifest a photographic image. Um, and some of my tools, I should say, to to move around it um, ultimately is poetry, you know, mm -hmm. thinking about other parallels that don't go right to the point, right? Like there, it's not always, or it isn't a didactic or descriptive, even though sometimes poetry is descriptive, but you understand what I'm saying, <laughs> literal. It, it moves and hovers and um, working in this section, I just, and I, I think Barbara and Karen could attest, it took me a very long time to deliver this to you. <laughs> I was like, wait, it's not ready yet. No, wait, no, wait, um, no, wait, forget that one. There's another one. Um, because I would read it. Like I would yeah. keep reading it. Like, no, that's not the one or that's this. Mm. And um, I've also worked with, um, uh, closely with photographers and this, I mean, some of this comes with working with, with anyone who has a, a relationship to their craft to, to give notation. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you, if anyone has had a relationship with the musician and you're learning, you, there's, it's always about tailoring or fine tuning and um, focusing or refocusing. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in, in that. And I also have had experiences with, you know, working with various photographers and, you know, that aspect, you know, I just thought like, it would be interesting to populate that space with a kind of political poetics, if you will, mm -hmm. like an another way of, instead of making it only about aesthetic, inter you know, the functionality of the camera, or, like how to capture something, but what about not to, you know, when do you mm -hmm. not photograph something? When do you stop? When do you, um, you know, reposition yourself, reposition your assumptions? about what it is that you're seeing or, you know, how do you um, navigate or reposition? And so this became that dance, if you will, as well mm -hmm. as um, putting pressure on the tool, on, on the act um, of being really. I think, you know, photography, the, the camera or thinking about photography in a way is a, a little bit of a ruse because mm -hmm. ultimately, it is this device that mediates an experience between you and the world or you and others. Um, and, and what happens in that negotiation, I think is, is so key. And so if this operates as my, my own, I guess, um, interior reflection, I hope also that it emanates out from that too, that it could be both macro, um, micro and macro at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the second aphorism is confront the camera with the entire body, not just from the perspective of the eyes, which is another way of saying the camera is not the issue in a way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the camera is not the issue, but it's also an issue. Right. Exactly. It's not the issue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm always, I'm almost tempted to ask if you would like to read some. Okay. Sure. Just to see. Okay. Um. The picture is more than what, a, what is pictured. Remember the unified field. Sacred geometry isn't just for architecture and painting. Shake the photograph as craft. Meter for the inner light. 
Be fearless in approaching the unknowable. Try to unsee what was once a stereotype. Those are too easy to repeat and are all too familiar, which can be seductive. There is a richness in tone in every tone and how it's difficult to undo the damage you've done once the codes under, once the codes run under scanner too. So if you capture the flame and it's painful, you just charge that to the game because it's shameful to just fall back and complain that you fractured the laws of attraction again. Focus on the more passionate plane. That is a quote. Establish a central pole, no false notes, make it plain, get the heart, begin and end there. There is difference between heart and sentiment. Shape with light first, sculpt with light first. Mistaken identity is almost always in the mind of the foot of the foot photogra photography. It is like a bright sunny day, creating our shadows everywhere. Create a filter. May I stop there? <laughs> of course. <laughs> and I think it's important, I mean, for this section, and I hope you have an opportunity to sit with this, because I almost don't know if it's important for them, for the aphorisms to, I mean, to voice them, I think it's very important to read them mm. and also the same with the images. So like looking at Lorna Simpson's pieces, Sherry Levine's pieces, Adrian Piper's funk lessons, um, James Van Der Zee's, um, the heirist, like it's really important to also read, like I think it's really important to also read imagery uh, as well as reading aphorism so it's to me some aspect of this is um kind of undoing some aspects of how i learned to to the art of photography i guess i will say that mm -hmm. um and trying to deconstruct sounds too ordered it's actually not that i think it's to really scramble or um, uh, scramble even sounds like it's about not making sense, but to maybe because we're close to the kitchen and legacy Russell is like, I'm thinking of like a glitch. glitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like that looking in that direction. I was like glitch, <laughs> but you know, just like creating attention. Um, and yeah, and I and I think in some instances, I hope that this does become some kind of manual, if you will, like for another generation of photographers, mm -hmm. the way that I entered Deb Willis's book as a young artist, even though I wouldn't have called myself that at the time when I encountered mm -hmm. it. Um, and, you know, that some aspect of this could speak to a kind of inner consciousness to want to rebel somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's room for new forms, you know, to address or to begin to attempt to address what we're dealing with here, yeah. right? Because if for many years, um, you know, some aspect of photography carried with it, and it still does, right? Like um, histories of inequality, of um, ways of subordin you know, subordination or a kind of... Um, uh, eschewing of of another, right? To push them into an other. Um, that's the same form that can also do so many other things, right? And so it, I'm interested in some aspect of photography or how I'm utilizing it and also how I think this, this section, though I, I think we can also move to talk about other aspects of the book, like the intro and also mm -hmm. the um, the interviews and the ending. But um, if we want to call it the ending, it's also maybe the beginning. <laughs> but um, yeah, that I think it some aspect of it. It's like how it's a form, 
right? It's a methodology, if if without a better word, right? Of like cre- deconstructing something, processing and creating a new. And if um and if my art, that's the the frequency that my art making um stays within. And so there's times where it's almost um less visible to people. I think I would like to. Mm. I think oftentimes. Um, I'm interested in focusing in on something that, you know, has a kind of, um, vibration sounds odd, but like, it's, it's, um, still responsive. Like it's not a dead issue. It's not the past. It's, there's something still there. And, um, I think for a long time, much of my work was seen as somewhat pushing on a relationship to nostalgia and to the past, mm-hmm. even though I address or bring past elements into the work, um, but they they are activated, you know, through the through the <laughs> through the structure of the work. Um, and so, thinking about this as a kind of methodology for addressing, um, you know, some aspect of the image field as it relates to social justice or as it relates to um, a kind of personal accounting, right, for how we consume, passively consume images or celebrate images or share images. Um, I hope that this is a kind of uh, process or an example of a way of processing. I love the idea of this book as a as a manual, because of course it's not necessarily what strikes you at first sight, because <laughs> you, you wonder where the instruction manual is for the manual, <laughs> at least before you spend time with it. And It's then, true. and then if, if you give it some of yourself, if you, if you commit to it, then the manual opens up in a way. Uh, and I was thinking, I was really thinking about this actually, as I was reading, especially as I was reading the, um, or rereading the, um, the, the the conversation you had with Deborah Willis, because so you, you mentioned earlier through reading Trinks um, was, actually I have it with me if anybody wants to look at it. <laughs> I'm sure they have it. I hope the um, bookstore has it. If not, we, we will check <laughs> and, we, and, we will, and we will take measures. <laughs> um, but in, in the, in the, uh, In the conversation, Deborah Willis mentions another book, which is The Sweet Fly Paper of Life, uh, which was important to her when she was young as a book that suddenly made something possible or suddenly showed a way mm. or suddenly filled an absence. Mm. Of... It felt in your questions to her that, um, that picturing us played that role for you possibly in a different way, but still. And, and that this question of like transmission or the generations mm-hmm. kind of remains posed, but always um, in new terms mm. in a way. Remains posed, but always um, in new terms mm. in a way. No, thank you for, for saying that. We were actually just talking about Roy Ducarv <laughs> some ago. Um, But the beauty in that book is, again, like, you know, I'm saying again, but if you haven't um, read it, it's Langston Hughes' poetry and Roy DeGarva's imagery, but um, it's fictional, right? So there's a kind of musing as it relates to image. And if you think about that during that time period, right? Like that gesture of musing, being playful, like, you know, um, repositioning, a kind of an imagined life of um, black people in that time period, I think that's a really radical gesture um, and a very political one too. And I think we're kind of picking up on and feeling um, inspired. Um, that's completely how I felt with her book, mm. you know, and encountering it. And also that it, for me, because if in picturing us, it's also her inviting others to reflect on images like Bell Hooks and Angela Davis. And so it, there is this kind of like um, allowing for the political 
um, and the feminist position and all of these things to kind of intersect in ways that were not so ordered, right? So some mm. people chose very personal images and um, were, were able to pull out of that um, a very political um, analysis of, of the time. Um, and then others, you know, ch chose, um, you know, images that were historical and also speaking to, um, like, for instance, uh, you know, the images of lynching and things like that that I mentioned earlier that are a kind of extreme haunting. Um, so, yeah, I just thought that book kind of covered so much mm -hmm. um, and also helped give voice to the way that I make work. Mm -hmm. What you said earlier about, did you want to say? Mm, no. No. <laughs> what you said earlier about, you know, you're, you're thinking through the aphorisms and this idea of deconstructing and reconstructing, it, it kind of echoed in my mind with certain things that Ariella says in her conversation about, I think the term she uses is unlearning, mm -hmm. which is also the, the subtitle of her latest book, Potential History, Unlearning Imperialism with this idea of what she was trying to do in the civil contract of photography and in her later work as well, in terms of, it was kind of redefining a political ontology of photography through unlearning what we thought photography was, mm. like unlearning the idea of photography, uh, the relation between photography and ownership mm. or photography as being just a relation between a photographer and a, and a subject that is photographed or the idea that um, a photograph stops at, at, at the border of its frame basically so all of all of these um, uh, things mm. uh, I'm interested in in you saying a little more about your encounter with with Ariella's uh, work I noted as I was thinking about the book that the three of you are um artists and researchers and educators mm. um yes <laughs> and, so, and so talking That's about really unlearning mean. in the context of learning. teaching yeah, photographs exactly. right <laughs> exactly isn't that a conundrum there um i i feel like uh, <laughs> it's true uh, i struggle with it daily um i think for me, and I, I didn't say this, so I was really drawn to third cinema mm. and some of the language. Um, we also talked about Usman Semben and just like really loving um, his films. And there's something about that moment and Hali Garima is also someone mm. else who, and you know, just the, the fact that both, if we just take, um, uh, Usman Semben and also Hali Karim, they also wrote, right? And also mm. had very particular ways of utilizing language and story that then their imagery, I think also kind of in so many ways, I think reflects that kind of um, deep analysis. Um, and so there's something about Ariel's case, I don't know how to describe it, mm. that for me, it called to me on that level. It's, it's to me, it's it's um, instructive. It's um, you know she's so precise, um, and I there's something about it that to me, um, maybe another project we'd also think about her writing in in relationship to um, as, as it relates to third cinema in the mid twentieth century. I just think mm. there's something there's something there, or at least I, to me that primed me. That primed me to be able to encounter her her writing, um, and also see it as an act of liberation. So, mm -hmm. as much as she's addressing and being extremely critical and redirecting, um, I see it also as a liberatory gesture. Um, did that answer your question? I'm not sure if I pointed to. Um. I thought I heard you say what connected you to her. Yes, it, it did. <laughs> so I, but like, I think there's more to say. Okay. But, okay. <laughs> but, well, one of the things that, that the, the conversation dwells on in terms of her work mm. is this idea of, which I think 
I mean, was always in her work and is even more in, in the latest work about the potential, this idea of the potential, the potential history, uh, which is an idea of, you could call it against temporal closure or something mm. like that, you know, which is the idea that one of the things that must be unlearned is the idea that what is photographed is sealed in a past mm. that is inaccessible. Mm. I mean, you know, to talk again about what you mentioned about nostalgia and all of that. Mm -hmm. And with what she, one of the things she's saying is that um, that is not the case. And with the way she talked about it, instant is she's talking about a Palestinian in a photograph who's not simply looking at the photographer, he's also looking at us who will be looking at the photographs much mm -hmm. later. And so that way we can reestablish a relationship with that context, open it up and, and have a different kind of um, mobilizing of, of the image or, or, or um, political intervention. And, and I was struck by the fact that at least in this conversation, she's always talking about the, the human subject of photography. You know, she's talking about a, a, a person who is pho photographed um, whereas this kind of refusal of the, you know, temporal closure, as I called it, in, in your work, which I think is very active in your work by, you know, you know uh, juxtaposing different layers of time in the same image mm -hmm. by the interplay of the, the two-dimensional photography with sculpture with architecture with materiality um happens in the quasi absence of the human figure mm. right it's um it's a, a a kind of um i don't know it's a, it's a it's a it's almost as though you were invoking agency through um, mater materiality material mm. objects that are not animate or human i would love to hear you more about that oh that's interesting <laughs> Um, so much to say, so much to say, I think, um, but something I, I mean, this notion of refusal, I think is a very powerful, I guess I just want to maybe focus mm -hmm. on that for a second. Um, because it looks different for every artist, I want to say, like, I feel like, in many ways, both of these women practice an element of that. Um, either refusal to confirm a refusal to, um, um, I guess, to allow the status quo to continue to allow for certain hegemonic structures to, you know, just overpower and repeat. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm definitely in that tradition. <laughs> and it is, um, it's a task. Mm -hmm. It is a task. At least um, both formal and political structures. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and so I think that for me, and, and perhaps this does also get into why there is a sadness or a mm -hmm. melancholy, I hope, as it relates to some aspect of this book. If you read the intro and the yeah. outro, um, <laughs> it is, you know, pointing to the what happens when certain bodies are pictured mangled dead um certain bodies mm -hmm. right are pictured in a manner you know within the frame or within the realm of ab abject right or objection i feel like for me um removing the body mm -hmm. right and i guess um sorry if i'm not being clear i'm Right, like there aren't images of Brianna Taylor's and I don't want to see it. Um, and in the end, not because she doesn't deserve justice because she does, but because of what that does to a kind of collective consciousness. And I'm not proposing that I know what that would do. Um, Mamie Till's decision to allow for the completely mangled face of her son to be published and circulated, that can only happen once. I almost feel, you know, I feel like that is, that was a one time moment. Um, and, you know, it's after effects. Um, and so I'm, I'm sensitive to 
how images um, can continue a kind of violence and, you know, in a post memory way, right? Like I wasn't even born during that time, but I feel the effects of that image. Um, how, how can that be? Um, but it, but it, it's there. And it was called up again uh, when we all had to witness um, the death of George Floyd. And I think it's um, a kind of ripple and disquieting that we don't have an image and we shouldn't, and we don't because it's just reality of Breonna Taylor. But what kind of image do we have, you know? Um, and so it, there's a kind of unsettled disquieting that I hope this brief, <laughs> dense, but perhaps um, open manual is a kind of test, you know, testimony, you know, mm -hmm. or a, 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 a trying to, by pulling in Ariella's logic and her research and her positioning, bringing in Deborah Willis and her research and her positioning, trying to locate myself with the aphorisms and then kind of having the the two bookends as a test and a testimony to making this during a very difficult time, mm -hmm. you know, and an unresolved time and unfinished where we haven't, we haven't fully resolved this, you know, um, and also trying to be mindful of not recreating a kind of um, violence by pointing to it. Like I, we, we talk about this a lot in the context of IDS in some instances where at what point, even though you're interested in something and it becomes the subject of one's art, is it also just a kind of recreation or a perpetuation mm -hmm. of the thing that you, you feel like you're addressing or you're critiquing, right? So this isn't critique. This is, I think is a somewhat of a testimony to um, being and grappling with um, what's actually happening and the role that images play in happening and the circulation, the endless circulation, which I think um, I feel like some some aspect of how this book is ordered mm -hmm. is a, a nod to that, right? Um, this kind of timelessness that we all feel on the on um, searching for images on the internet, right? So it's like everything is always ever present. Um, and, you know, when you encounter something, so be beginning in the middle of this or starting, at, right? It's like, you're kind of lost. Um, and, um, but you find your way through the echoes of, um, and repetition. Sorry, Thank I always you. end in like a odd moment. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like I have nothing more to say. <laughs> no, it's, I think it's a great virtue of tempo there. Um, we haven't said yes. that opens the book and from which the, the, the cover image, or at least the, the top part of the cover is excerpted. Um, uh, well, would what like to say? To say? Yeah, I, know. I mean, I it's um. Well, I feel like it is. I hope it's a. So there are images of the kind of recreation or simulation of the New York Times attempt to simulate what actually happened um, when officers kind of entered the home, of Rihanna Taylor. Um, so it's all kind of in this uh, fabrication mode. Um, it's it's such an odd, it's so odd. It's like a forensic animation. It video. is a forensic animation video and completely uh, distancing to the point of fiction in a in a way that is uh, not quite right. I don't know how to describe mm -hmm. it. It's like not quite. I I I understand the intention but it's not quite it. So something's like not quite there. So anyway, I wanted to, you know, start with how I witnessed, right? Her death in essence, along with many others um, on the screen mm. and putting a lot of tension on the negative space. So um, 
and I think maybe to circle back to your other question, like the most important body for me is the body that's in the present addressing the work. So mm. the construction and the gaze and the, the way in which um, I work with photography to reposition the gaze. Bro Willis also talks about the gaze, gaze, especially with her new, her new work. Um, but so for me, the gaze is, a, is um, subverted with putting pressure almost in a reflexive way back onto the person who's, um, who's, who's directly in the moment addressing the work, if that makes sense. So um, instead of it being a scenario where you're witnessing someone else engage, um, you are that kind of very important body that needs to be as present and connected as possible. So, um, so anyway, so the, these are kind of set up in this manner. They're also augmented. So I am digitally um, manipulating them slightly, but not, not to the point where they lose their efficacy. I think they're mm -hmm. still what they are, but they become slightly more uncanny. Also, that they're still, they don't have the narration, the words of the no. kind of New York Times commentary are not there, um, et cetera. And it ends with like something that I think is, uh, I feel like what I said in the beginning, like a kind of gesture towards her, mm -hmm. um, towards the her being Breonna Taylor and using some of the language of, um, uh, a funerary, a funeral program, right? Where it's like sunrise when the person entered into the world and sunset, like something that was a little bit more personal and... Um, Elegiac. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a different context, but I was reminded um, when I first just saw the, the sequence of images, it made me think of the... Um, would you call it a visual essay? I think that the publication called it uh, a, a structural film. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in <laughs> in the form of sequences of of photographs, mm -hmm. which was your contribution to um, the Carnegie International in 2018, which was these in three chapters. Yes. Uh, and, and <laughs> Published by Dancing. Fox. There's a side conversation going on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was published by Nancy. Okay, I didn't see. Amazing. I didn't even know. <laughs> Connections make themselves. <laughs> it was called Anatomy of a Flower, and each chapter was a kind of um, a different positioning of looking at the institution in mm -hmm. a way, right? Like, like the Panopticon was the first one from above, and then the second one was called forget but it was pedestrian. pedestrian so you're inside and the third one was innermost innermost, innermost. <laughs> and you're you're really in the archive in the bowels of the institution looking at these archival documents and, and things like that uh which you know it, it, it can feel like um a stroll into the institution but but for instance if you've read anything by Ariel Azulay about archives and museums. It also feels like a confrontation of certain types of violence um, through uh, the gaze and the construction of image and narrative mm. and browsing. But I don't know how in your mind this work and that work, in what way they coexist. Mm, I think it's really, well, they coexist because they're both in a book form. Mm -hmm. But this, I think, was brief for the purpose of almost working as an initializing shot in a film, right? That kind of gives you a place, right? It mm -hmm. gives you a sense of where mm -hmm. you are. And so I kind of saw this as, as that. Establishing shot. Establishing mm -hmm. shot. Um, where um, I think for the National um, Anatomy of a Flower is an intervention not only within the exhibition because it, the work didn't exist in the exhibition, it exists right. in the publication. So it was always kind of intended to be 
um, a kind of intervention into the logic of, of the gesture of the exhibition. Um, and also to allow for, um, always interested in the belated, but there's something about creating distance. Mm -hmm. um, it just creates a different resonance and a way of thinking um, about being someplace or about mm -hmm. not being someplace, yeah. about not being included. Yeah. I mean, it, it to me, it felt like a, a certain, you could call it productive refusal if, mm. to reuse the word refusal that, you, mm. that we mentioned. It's that kind of distance that is um, an engagement by other means. You know, yes. Or on your own terms. Yes, that sometimes has to be performed. I don't know how else mm. to say it. Mm. Um, and that was a, in, in a scenario of performing it. Um, this I think is a little different. It is um, setting a tone. Through a, a kind of way thing, you know. Yes. Yeah. I think we're going to open up. I just want to first ask you about the title. This yes, this long <laughs> title. Postscript, <laughs> archives, <laughs> annotation. The unfolding of time as image and agency. Yes. Well, Sarah, what happened? Speaking of time and the temporal displacement, I mean, I have flashbacks to 2019, 2020, different times in 2020, summer of 2021. Um, I felt like now that you're asking this, I'm talking. <laughs> um, we were talking about filmic terms, but when we first received the images of your official essay and the layout with Chad, I felt like you were in media red, like just dropped into the book. Mm. You kind of just were there with it. Mm. You had to figure it out. Um, so, but to the, that, I my recollection, that title arrived. First thing. Yeah, it was first the first thing. thing. Wow. Yeah. No, it didn't. So that's kind of a trust instinct. <laughs> there you go. Trust instinct. And how and hopefully other people will trust you. But I I think, you know, because I was also I did not participate in the first space of teaching photographs. And so this notion of being a postscript was already there. Um, and knowing that I was already thinking about Deborah Willis and, you know, thinking about the power of photographs um, and also um, the structure of addressing them, right, almost as the time you think about it and that that in itself is um, a kind of agency, right? So an image that can be completely humiliating or dehumanizing can then become through your process of addressing it, um, the reverse, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, the, something else can happen. That may be just for you <laughs> and that's okay. Right. That's enough. So um, I think the title was already there. Now, what was going to happen from that? I knew I wanted to, you know, and it's kind of now blurring and merging because as soon as, 2020 hit, it's just madness just started to happen. And it was like, how to make me hit, it's just madness just started to happen. And it was like, how to make sense that we have to do this as a public mm -hmm. gesture. And I'm so thankful to Ariella and Deborah Willis that they agreed. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how many people tuned in and had a relationship to it, but it's like, actually, we have to enact this now, you know? So, so this is, I think, a, a different moment. And this is the exact form for this moment. But in the time, um, it needed to be a live mm. uh, engagement and also within the same space that circulates images um, to, to kind of be in a position of um, thinking through mm. their impact. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, let us know if you have any questions. Pasi and I like silence. Oh, we love so it. So don't worry. You can worry. take your time. <laughs> think about it. 
still it in your mind, meditate a little bit, and let us know if you'd like. I just wanted to have a little addendum to what you just said. I think that one thing that that appears in the conversations also is what you're saying is emphasized by your inclusion of all of the timestamps of the conversation as it happened in that's yeah, right. Hmm. That have a manifestation in real time. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, I can pass mine if you'd like. Karen, yes. Thank you very much. It's a really fantastically inspiring conversation. I have a question about scale. Um, and I have not looked at the book um, mm. and have such great admiration for everyone involved in the two boxes to Ariel Line, but of course you guys did. How how did you arrive at such a precise economic freedom? You know, it's so um, intentional. It seems that every single page has a purpose and a meaning and a role to play within the book. Mm. I think those various components of it, I and mean, how you began, I would have thought it got to be at least 200 pages. Well, I was going to say, maybe Ariella's interview could have easily be. <laughs> very long, very, very long in a great way. Um, so yes. so I can't take credit for all of that. I really think it's a team effort, you know, but I can say in, and I think what I really respect about Dancing Foxes and also Shannon, who is a dear friend too, and has, I admire her work a great deal. And also like working with another artist who's sensitive to your work. Cause what you just described, I feel like I aim to do in every mm. artwork that I ever create. And I have Lucien Terra here to attest to that. And Melissa, <laughs> to like, just, I kind of obsessively will not release something until it's exactly, I kind of refuse to. This. Yes, it is. And I think it's because of also having a great team that's, you know, we're, we're discussed because I can't see, you know, at this, when we were working on this, I was just focused on the fragments or the parts. And I think what was really amazing in this process that I think Shannon's vision of um, PPI is like seeing the whole, you know? And even though it has, it already had a structure, I mean, it's, it's a signature, it has a certain amount of pages, but then it was like how to still allow for my particular um, issue to be authentic um, to the process, right? Like we did all of these things and it's true. And each one could be its own um, kind of long form essay in essence. Um, but I think with this teetering on also it as an artwork um, in and of itself, there was this um, balance of trying, you know, how to fit things, how much. And I, I remember, I think, advocating, like, we have to have these images. Is That is haunting. Like, what is, what is the inheritance of this struggle? And it's like, that is it, you know? So to have that, I, like, had to have this image, you know? And, like, where do funk lessons come in? You know, so I needed to have those there because, um, because of it as an artwork. You know, and allowing for this kind of metadata to be embedded um, within the the text, right? And it's like how to to do that. And and this is the design Chad as the designer, you know, trying to fit it all. So I think the density that um, and then Karen with the editing of everyone's <laughs> interviews and like what to keep and what you know, so all of it, I think. Um, you know, it was with the tenor of working with another artist, you know, and I think with that, I hope that this, um, you know, carries that uh, forward, you know, without losing anything. Yeah. 
Sure. It, it may be too early since it's so new, but I'm curious if it's if this book is meant to be there for classrooms and if you've had conversations with students about. Um, I have not directly. Um, I have. I was invited to Pratt to speak uh, once we completed um, completed the book, and did so in the form of a lecture. So that may be actually for Shannon and Sarah to maybe speak to. I mean, I um, because PPI is also part of a program right within photography at Pratt. Um, Institute. So I haven't been on the ground, you know, hearing and understanding how students have processed it. Um, but, you know, during the Q&A, &A, during that um, event, it did feel like it was speaking to or, or puncturing a silence, right? So it's like it, it was doing something and it was a, a wedge in a way, right? An opening to a flood of other things that really I can't wait to read or I can't wait to see or I can't wait to engage with, right? That's forthcoming. So, but thank you. Yeah. I don't know, Omar, have you? <laughs> no, because I've, I've only um, <laughs> discovered it recently. <laughs> so not yet. <laughs> Um, but Omar and I, I think, which is why I was so um, excited to do this with Omar, because in the spirit of IDS, which we do teach together, the interdisciplinary seminar at Cooper Union, that has a long history over 30 years, Doug Ashford, Helen Molesworth, Walid Rod, <laughs> many people have led it. Um, and it's been a joy to do it with uh, Omar, because it is like an unfinished conversation. So each week that we're doing it. And we also, how we um, basically come up with our themes um, is with thinking about the questions that students have, like the pressing questions, maybe the questions that they don't know that they have yet, but that, um, you know, are seeping through their work in some way, or, um, you know, are a kind of, on a, are on a deeper level to some of their initial questions that may, so, and we've done that, you know? And so even though this is a very unique object, but the fact that Ariella Zule came, you know, to IDS, we were actively doing IDS in 2020 as well, you know? So these are our contexts and being unafraid to address um, entailments, right? That are, um, that are laid bare, you know, so it isn't a completely intellectual, right, endeavor. It's actually about the heart. It's about um, compassion. It's about art's ability to um, live in that terrain and help us collectively sit in that terrain for a bit. Um, so, yeah, so I think in a, I guess, um, in an indirect way, I think, yes, we have over the, I don't know what you Yeah, say. just to add to that, I was, I was going to say that um, those certain elements in the book were not familiar to me. I could say I recognized. Bye, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> I could say I recognized both, I mean, Leslie and some of our conversations in class and otherwise in on every page of the book and also definitely Leslie as an artist in the structuring of the book and in, mm. in, in the economy of the book that, that was very clear to me. The other thing I should say is that I had thought, I didn't do it, but I had thought of structuring this conversation <laughs> through, because for the ideas, the interdisciplinary seminar lecture series, we what we do is each year, so over two semesters, we pick three questions or themes, we call them currents. They're usually one word or a couple words uh, each. And so there are three of them that structure our invitations to people in our teaching for the whole year. And so this this is the sixth year. And I and I went and list and put on a list all the different currents from 2017 to now. And it seemed to work for you to just structure the conversation by using these themes. So I was gonna say, okay, counterpoint, and we're gonna talk about this part of the book and dream work and 
and scale. We're going to talk about this part of the book and aftermath and mark making wow. and trace and movement and stasis and thresholds of the image, etc. So, <laughs> so we've been having this conversation. Yes. <laughs> yes. I love that. Why didn't you tell me that? Because I thought of it this afternoon, and then and then I thought maybe it would be a little. Anyway, it would have. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> but it was there in the yes, background. Yes, yes, yes. As you know, it doesn't yes. have to be stated to yes. be there. Yes. Stated <laughs> yes. to be there. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so true. Can I ask oh yeah. In that, in that seminar, um, what are the outcomes for those students? Is it students or just for the students, it's an entire life change, of course. <laughs> For everyone else, we don't know. But to tell you something about the structure, it's it's um, it's it's both um, a public lecture series, meaning there is a component of it that is open to anyone who cares to come and listen and engage through the Q and A, and it cares to come and listen and engage through the Q&A, and it's almost every week, which is why I said there's been many, many, many in, in the last five and a half years. And then the, the other component is, is closed, which is a seminar with a small group of students who engage with the, the guest speakers and with the readings that we um, assign in relation to, um, to, to the, the currents, as we call them, and to the invited guests. So it's it's this way in which a lecture series doubles up. Also, I don't I don't think that's how. I mean, it's we're we we move at a certain pace, and to me, which I think is true in the pursuit of art, um, in the study of it that you know, mission is really endless and it's not really for me or I re resist it. I mean, almost like, where are the, <laughs> where are the papers? Where are the <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We have a lot of inside humor here, but you know, I just think it's just an opening just to cr create a space for um, students to be to think in a different way like that may not have a manifestation until I don't know when, or maybe it will happen in their work before it, they could voice it, you know? And I think that's amazing. Um, so for, for me, it's really just being uh, attentive mm -hmm. as an artist and attentive to a, a generation of artists that are forthcoming. That's all I can do. And also to create a space where we are, you know, unafraid to address the world that we're in, you know, and to be there to support them, right? To not leave them there, <laughs> yeah, but and, to and be in a, in a, with them. Yeah. And to address questions from, from a variety of angles. But on the surface, don't necessarily, the connection is not always obvious, but the idea is to create the, the framework and the space for those conversations to happen. And, um, and it's and these are young students they're undergrads and they're 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 thinking their work everything is in formation and we and we try to create a kind of generative space at you know some intersection between what they're thinking of what they're working on and and, and the world so it can it can get overwhelming at times because it's big questions and it's you know every week and all of that but uh, but I think there are ways of making those frameworks for for it to be um, uh, fruit. Especially since twenty twenty, also students like there there's a fragility, you know. There's a there's a fragility in terms of dealing with the world, you know. The, the, even even the the material and practical circumstances of life, and so which is completely understandable. And so the idea is how to. I don't know how to say this, like to provoke them while supporting them at the same time in a way, you know, which is a way of not, not, not letting them down by, by, 
you know, like supporting them, but still pushing them a little bit, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Something very alive and, uh, you know, embodied in what um, you know, the product that you're creating to create is and is discussing here. This is the world, this is me, and all of the jumble, whatever the correct word that was, we were searching, we were searching for in jumble and was the structure. Mm. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, again. Oh, one last question. Well, I don't. I haven't. I haven't taught a class on it in any way, um, and I think I'm mostly interested in. I mean, I, I'm not um, interested in like, you know, censorship. So I think I wouldn't be a proponent of that. But what happens when you encounter it, right? And what is the context that you encounter it in? Is it a museum? Is it a postcard? A carte de visite? Is it? Um, randomly on the internet, right? And so these, I guess for me, it was more so about what to do after that encounter, right? What world, we are in the world that the, those scenarios have happened. Um, and for me, it coupled or housed in an aesthetic object like a photograph is complex. Um, it's extremely complex, and I think it's deserving of all the all of our attention to to find ways and new ways because we are changing as a society, right? So how one would speak about that image in like let's say 1980 versus you know 2001 um, to now, right? It's different. We we are different, so it's it is a constant um, engagement that's needed, you know. So I wouldn't, I I'm not for censoring in any way. I would not keep those me personally, but um, I also have to address what happened when I when I when I have seen it, as well as it's it's also a reality that those images and that those scenarios to even create those images happened, right? So how to um, address that, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question. So I don't, I don't teach in that way, you know? So, but there are many people who do and there's many exhibitions. There was a, an exhibition um, around the lynching photographs, I think in 2000, I wanna say, um, here at the, New York Historical Society. Um, and that's when I first encountered them. And it was unbelievable. Um, so, and what's more unbelievable is that people, I mean, they were in postcard form. So meant to be shared, I was there. What world is that? kind of mind shattering. So um, so Deborah Willis helped construct for me a language to voice what, voice not only voice from audibly, but in my work, what that encounter, you know, did and how really, what are the mechanisms to um, to look, but also to refuse to repeat, to um, voice anger, to voice um, sadness, to voice, and also describing like the affect and what happens when all of that is like in a daguerreotype or something that has all of these very aesthetic beautiful qualities like that's of so bizarre that is the most bizarre scenario um 
So, yeah, I don't know if I can say more, but thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.